There are a lot of good YouTube channels uh, by Latter-day Saints now that have some wonderful content, and uplifting things and insights related to the gospel. However, I'm concerned uh, about a few false ideas that seem to be getting popular uh, among some of the uh, YouTube channels and social media. And I wanted to take this video to point those out, those ideas that I think are incorrect and that have been getting popular, and to point out why I think they're wrong and, uh, and kind of let you know where I stand on the subject. There are six of them, and um, the first one of these is the idea, was Brigham Young bad? There's a, been a number of people who have been taking the stance that uh, Brigham Young was bad, that Joseph Smith had things right, and then Brigham Young was wrong. They've used this in uh, relation to race and priesthood questions, related to women, women and priesthood questions, uh, related to plural marriage and other things. And, um, and I have a concern about that. Uh, and my particular concern is not so much to get into the, the weeds related to the race and priesthood questions or the um, plural marriage questions or women and the priesthood questions, but it's more just to make it clear that we need to remember and accept that Brigham Young was selected as a leader of the church. He did have the priesthood keys. He was a prophet of God. He was selected by God to be the president of the church after Joseph Smith. And we should focus primarily and emphasize the good things about uh, Brigham Young and not the bad things, because focusing on the bad things will lead us uh, to a bad place. For Brigham Young in particular, for me, one of the things that makes a difference uh, is the account of his transfiguration as seen by a number of different witnesses after the after Joseph Smith died. If you'll recall, after Joseph Smith died, there was concern about who should be the new leader of the church. Uh, and Joseph Smith had indicated that the uh, Quorum of the Twelve um, had all of the keys before he passed, but nevertheless, there was sort of a contest on who should be the new leader. Sidney Rigdon came and and spoke and was arguing that he uh, should be the new leader of the church. When Brigham Young stood and spoke, there were a number of people that said that as they heard Brigham's voice and looked at Brigham, his voice sounded like Joseph Smith, his countenance looked like Joseph Smith. It was very became very clear to them that uh, God had chosen Brigham Young to be the leader of the church. And I think you need to hold on to that a testimony. And um, so in looking back and figuring out some of the um, difficult historical aspects of the church, I just think it's important to not go down the road to to try to reach a conclusion that Brigham Young was bad or that uh, he did things that were contrary to what uh, God wanted. I'm not saying he was perfect. I'm not saying that everything he did was perfect or that he would never make a mistake, but just that Remember that he has the keys, he was chosen, and um, and keep it with that. The second uh, thing is uh, this one, that the idea of uh, reincarnation, or are there multiple lives or multiple mortal probations? And uh, for this one, for me, it's just completely contrary to the collective teachings and understandings of the prophets and of our understanding of the plan of salvation. Now, I understand that people that that uh, argue for this will point to a stray scripture or a stray, a stray thought that they try to interpret to, to uh, support this, but they're just contrary. They're, they're taking things out of context, and it's really contrary to the collective, well-understood um, teachings of the gospel and really kind of lets go of the iron rod in terms of what we know to be the, the plan of salvation. When you get into this idea of multiple lives, this sort of reincarnation kind of aspect, it, it doesn't fit with 
the plan of salvation as we've been taught it. And what it does is it makes people lose the understanding or the thinking of the eternal consequences of what we do in this life. That part of the key of the plan of salvation is that this life is the time to prepare to meet God. What we do in this life is what we'll be judged for. And what we do in this life will, will determine or have effect on, on where we go hereafter. When you get this idea of uh, multiple mortal lives, you start thinking, well, what does that mean then in terms of uh, resurrection? You know, which which body are you resurrected in? What does it mean in terms of uh, being sealed uh, to your spouse or to your family? Which spouse or which children are you sealed to? What does it mean in terms of judgment? Um, and uh, and it ends up being becoming, in my view leading to a sort of excusing or thinking that you won't have the consequences for what you do in this life. And, and um, so that is one I, I don't agree with, and I, I think we should be careful about. The third one is this one, where Old Testament prophets, Old Testament writers, bad. Now, this is uh, kind of become popular I know there's a book by uh, Dave Butler in the language of Adam. And uh, what the argument there is, is to uh, say that in the Old Testament, uh, that there were uh, these individuals who were sort of um, in secret or excluded, and that the writers of the Old Testament, particularly in the time periods uh, before, just before Lehi and after him were actually bad people and um and that they were trying to keep out christ and and an understanding of of heavenly mother and so forth now i think that this one is a mistake too to explain why let me first uh share the screen with you okay in this uh in this new theory this new reimagining of the old testament what they argue is that two um, figures in the Old Testament in particular, Hezekiah and Josiah, uh, they argue are actually bad people, that when Hezekiah and Josiah uh, reformed uh, to get rid of the idol worship in, in Jerusalem and in the areas outside of Jerusalem, they got the idols type stuff out of the temple and um, and then also centralized the worship in Jerusalem to get rid of the idol worship, they argue that this was actually a bad thing, that what they were really removing wasn't idols, it was um, stuff related to uh, Christ and Heavenly Mother, and uh, that Lehi was, they imagine, was on the side of, of these other people who were um, uh, attacked or persecuted by Hezekiah and Josiah. And that, that's the theory. Now, the problem is, is it is completely not consistent uh, with what the Bible says. So what I want to do is let's take a look at what the Bible says in terms of Hezekiah and Josiah. Let's first turn to, uh, here is the, the Bible dictionary entry related to Hezekiah. And this is the guy who they're saying was actually a bad guy. Uh, but as it says here in the Bible, in the Bible dictionary, it says Hezekiah was a great religious and political reformer. He suppressed idolatry and reconstituted the temple services. In his reforms, he had the assistance of the great prophet Isaiah. So he was good and he worked with Isaiah. The other one, Josiah, who came after him just prior to when Lehi. Um, so jo Josiah was the king until 610 BC. After Josiah, there were some evil kings. And then that's when Lehi tells people to repent, and that's when that's when he leaves. But um, in this new theory, they're saying that Josiah was bad. But in the Bible dictionary, it explains that Josiah, under the guidance of the high priest Hilkiah, again restored the temple, destroyed idolatrous images and the high places, put down idolatrous priests, and celebrated a great Passover. And then this led to the centralizing of worship at Jerusalem and abolishing the idolatrous sanctuaries, these pagan sanctuaries that were outside of Jerusalem. 
when you go and look into uh, the scriptures, let's uh, read the story of Hezekiah because actually he was a great he was a great man who did uh, great things, and he was associated with one of the greatest miracles in the Old Testament. So if you turn to Second Kings eighteen, and let's read a few of the things related to Hezekiah. So Hezekiah, uh, in chapter 18, as it says here, Hezekiah reigns in righteousness in Judah. It says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high places and break the images. The images refer to idols. And he cut down the groves. The groves re also refer to pagan idol worship, the corrupt pagan idol worship uh, and from the areas around them. And he break into pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. Now in the reimagining, the, this new reimagining of the Old Testament, they say, well, wait a second, the, that brazen serpent that represented Christ, so they're getting rid of Christ. No, what they're doing is they're getting rid of something that people were burning incense to it. Yes, the brazen serpent originally represented Christ on the cross, but they didn't know that. They were still under the veil of not fully understanding uh, what it represented. They didn't know that the image represented Christ. That's something that after Christ was raised on the cross that becomes apparent to us because we see the fulfillment. To them, they, are, they, they didn't see it as representing Christ. But even if they did, regardless, it's just like the golden calf. So if you remember with the Ten Commandments, that at the time Moses goes up onto Sinai, he comes down, Aaron had made a golden calf. And of course, that that's wrong. He was not supposed to make the golden calf. Well, what Aaron said was the golden calf was made to represent God. It was made to represent Elohim. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It's still being used as an idol, right? So whether the brazen serpent was to represent Jesus Christ or not, the fact that it was being used to, you know, this mistaken of thinking the image is, is God was the common and corrupt misunderstandings from that time. The people around that time, all of the pagans, they would confuse and think that the gods were or at least were in part these um, these graven images. And so regardless of what it originally may have uh, symbolized, the fact that they're burning incense to it and uh, praying to it is a violation of the commandment of God that they will make no graven image, they will not bow down to any graven images and so forth. So in burning incense to it is a violation of the commandments of God. So what Hezekiah did here was correct. Okay, and then it says again with Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, or, nor any before him. He clave to the Lord, departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses, and the Lord was with him, and he prospered. Now, in Hezekiah's time, the Assyria was the great power, and Assyria threatened, came and threatened to, to conquer Jerusalem. Assyria had much greater strength and power in terms of armies. Um, Syria, Assyria sent a man named Rabshaka, who uh, spoke to the people in Jerusalem, and he gave this message. And he said to them, this is continuing in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 28. He says, hear the word of the great king, king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver, deliver you out of uh, the king of Assyria's hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying that the Lord will surely deliver us. And this city shall not be delivered into, delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah. So again, Hezekiah is clearly the good one, and the Assyria is the is the evil threat. And then the the uh, messenger from the king of Assyria says, Have any of the gods of the nations around delivered it, their lands out of the hand of the king of Assyria? You know, don't don't believe that your God is any different or can uh deliver you. And then in the next chapter, so in response to this, Hezekiah ends up uh, going up and praying. So it says Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. 
and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, and that hast made heaven and earth. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations in their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they've destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou holy, even thou alone, even thou only, is what I should say. Again, this is Hezekiah who, in this newer reimagining, is supposedly a, a bad guy or a corrupt guy. It, it's just not correct. In response, uh, they received the voice of the Lord. Uh, saith the Lord, I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. That's 185,000 Assyrian soldiers that were camped out around Jerusalem to besiege it, died overnight. And when they arose early in the morning, they were all dead corpses. So this is one of the greatest miracles of the Old Testament, the greatest saving of the people of Jerusalem. And it was done because Hezekiah, their king, was righteous and had turned them to righteousness and had gotten rid of the idol worship um, that was around at that time. So we should not think that Hezekiah was a bad guy. Hezekiah was a hero. Let's also take a quick look at uh, Josiah. That's in um, 2 Kings 22. So it's a few more chapters. So Josiah comes later. Uh, uh, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. This is 2 Kings 22. And again, it says, and he did that, which is right in the sight of the Lord. And then going into chapter 23, what he did was he he made the people stand up and make a covenant. It says the king's, this is Second Kings chapter 23, verse 3. And King Josiah stood by a pillar and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people stood to that covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple the vessels that were made for Baal, who was a, an, uh, uh, a, a false god, and for the grove, again, related to the false gods, and for the host of heaven, and then he, and he burned them. Okay, and then later it says in 21 through 25, and then he had the people keep a Passover unto the Lord, uh, as is written in the covenant. And so they, then they had a, this great uh, Passover and uh, and the again the workers of these wizards and these idol worshippers and other things and abominations were destroyed and then he had them um, uh, consecrate uh, uh, sorry uh, centralize the worship so that people would have to come to Jerusalem uh, for the temple worship to help make sure that it was regulated because of what was being done to idol worship in the other lands. Okay. So let's just take a, 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 a second to um, think about uh, whether one way we can know whether what Hezekiah and Josiah did there was correct. And let's go to the New Testament. This is in um, John chapter 4. This is the account of when Jesus goes up to Samaria. Now, Samaria was outside of Jerusalem. It was where the northern kingdom was anciently. It was where these uh, temples and hills and high places were destroyed by Josiah. And in this conversation that Jesus has with a woman of Samaria, she brings up this topic of when Josiah had destroyed the the temples outside and the high places and this, these idol worshiping places and so forth outside of Jerusalem, and uh, so that comes up in this conversation. So in John chapter four verse nine, Jesus speaks uh, to the woman of Samaria, and she asks him, "So how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria?" And they're they're at Jacob's well, and in the response. 
this will be familiar to you, I'm sure, in verse 18, he says, Jesus tells her, he says, thou hast had, he says something about her husband, and she says, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you've had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidst thou truly. Now there's, in this language, there's the straight language, and then there's symbolic uh, language and allegory that's happening here. And in the Old Testament, in the scriptures, the Lord refers to himself as the bridegroom, and the people are the bride. They are supposed to uh, be loyal and faithful only to him. He, they, will, they wait for him. He is to, to be their husband. And the Samaritans who went after these pagan gods, in the Old Testament, they use the allegory a lot of the people uh, being adulterous when they do this idol worship. It's like following after um, another husband when the Lord is supposed to be uh, the husband. So when he's talking to the women of Samaria, he sort of represents these Samaritans and he, and he says, you know, thou hast had five husbands, uh, and the one you're with isn't your husband. It's it, There's the straight meaning to her life, but it's also representative and symbolic of the fact that you went after others, not me, right? And the one that you're with now is not your husband because you didn't come after, you didn't wait for uh, the true bridegroom. So there's a second level of meaning there. But anyway, the woman responds to him, in verse 19, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then she says, this is the part that relates to Josiah. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. So she's referring to uh, when they would uh, worship in the mountains and not go to Jerusalem for, to worship. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And then ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she brings into question this issue to Jesus is, do we really, do we have to go to Jerusalem to, to worship? Or were the Jews right in doing that? And Jesus' response to her is to side with what they did in the Old Testament, what the Jews did in the Old Testament. What he tells her is that, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, he's telling her that, they, who they were worshiping, they didn't really know who they were worshiping. The Jews know who they worship. It is the Lord, and as about salvation is of the Jews. So he is saying that that what was done there in the Old Testament was correct. So the this new theory that um, that the Jews uh, were wrong and uh, and that to rethink all of that is incorrect. One more scripture that kind of helps explain that is, is Paul. And uh, the Apostle Paul is very good um, at explaining a lot of things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he kind of explains how in the Old Testament, they were given the law. And when Moses uh, presents the law to them, he had a veil over his face. The question is, why does he have a veil under over his face? And what Paul says is that this is symbolic to indicate that their understanding was veiled because of their obedience. And, and they, were, they didn't get the higher law. Instead, they got this lower law. They got the law of Moses, which was supposed to be a schoolmaster, and sort of teach them and point them towards Christ. But it's veiled to them, and they don't know it's Christ until after a Christ comes. And so as he says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, And as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, but which veil is done away in Christ. And even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart, meaning they don't understand that the things are about Christ. But when they turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So yes, the, the brazen serpent, that is something that uh, points to Christ. But in the Old Testament, they have a veil. They don't understand that it was, a, uh, it was about Christ. But that's the way God had it set up because of their wickedness, that they had this, uh, this lower law, this law of performance and ordinances, this law of Moses, which uh, would not be taken away until Christ come. 
scriptures. And then as they understand and recognize that Christ is the Messiah, then it becomes clear and the veil is taken away. Okay, my big concern with this new theory, there's actually, there's a lot, there's a lot good with it. And I should say that, you know, what people like about it is that it points to um, uh, affirmations that the, the temple stuff has been around for a long time. It points to Christ. So there's, there's good stuff about the theory, but I think where it goes wrong is when to bolster and add to that theory it starts saying that good people were bad and bad people were good. Start saying that Hezekiah and Josiah were bad and and not good. And and honestly, that's the that's the whole. They basically have made another uh, critical theory uh, head of a hydra, where now the you know which always wants to look at oppressors and oppressed and and victims and wants to make the the good people look bad and that they're and that the oppressed were the real heroes and it's everything is different and that's what they're doing here with the old testament they're trying to make hezekiah and josiah look bad uh, and trying to make the idol, idol worshipers who are worshiping these asherah and these idols outside of jerusalem to make them look like they were the good people and it's just a, a different form of a critical theory that I, I hope that uh, people understand that the theory goes too far there and, and should reject that. In addition, my concern about it is that it undermines the trust in and acceptance of the Old Testament. In the Articles of Faith 8, as it says there, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. Those accounts in the Bible and the Old Testament about Hezekiah, Josiah, those are translated correctly. When Joseph Smith did the translation of those, he didn't make any adjustments. That stuff is translated correctly. So I want you to recognize that if you go down the road of saying that, oh, well, those are bad people and the Bible is actually written by, by bad people under this new theory, you're, it's contrary to what we've been taught in the Article of Faith. Okay, now the next uh, one that I want to talk about briefly is this one, the idea that we have been given new scriptures. All right. And um, there is the possibility that we could receive new scriptures, but uh, one of the ones that they point that it's different people, but um, that are being pointed to are called the Nemenha uh, records. And I've taken a look at those, and I'm convinced that they're they're not authentic. Um, now, the for, and for each of these uh, for each of these things that I think are incorrect, I, I just want to know that it's it's that I think the ideas are incorrect, um, but the people are doing it in good faith, good people, and most of what they do is very good, very uplifting. It's just that I have concern about a couple of, of ideas that are getting popular that I think are incorrect. And uh, so let's take a look at the Nemenha records. The Nemenha records are uh, reported to be, or the, or the people that, uh, that uh, have brought them out say that they are additional records uh, from Native Americans, from people who were at the time of the Book of Mormon, who went to the land northward in the Book of Mormon. And then, and then the, there are these additional records that have come from them. And when I take a look at um, those records, and I have read them, but uh, when I take a look at the records, what it really, what it does is it's kind of like uh, pairs up so it's the stuff that happens off screen from the Book of Mormon. So, for example, we'll have uh, Hagoth who left um, in the in the Book of Mormon who leaves uh, the land and goes to the land northward. It has Hagoth, and then um, it it has uh, Jesus Christ uh, up here uh, to them as well. And then it has a couple of other people. For example, this is the son of Alma, Cory Ant, and it has Cory Anton. Uh, go up there and, and and it has accounts about them. Now, uh, in looking at the Nemenha records, if I had to sort of briefly describe them, I would describe it in my view as, to me, it reads like a modern 
um, retelling of somebody who sort of liked the Book of Mormon, but didn't like some things about the Book of Mormon and wanted to tell some things differently. And that's the way it kind of reads to me. Uh, because some of the things that are different uh, from the Nemanja records from the Book of Mormon kind of fit with common uh, complaints or gripes that people will have about the Book of Mormon. So, for example, in the Nemanja record, it has women having the priesthood, and it has women blessing the sacrament and giving blessings and stuff. It has uh, women very front and center in terms of uh, their names and their stories. It's very much, uh, you know, women as dominant characters in it. Uh, in addition, it has uh, some things that some people uh, don't like about the current church. For example, it kind of says that tithing is all about money. It really should be a lot of concentration, uh, consecration, helping the poor and, and not about tithing. Uh, it, kind of, it indicates that temple worship should be open to everybody, that you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't go to somebody else to determine your worthiness to be able to attend the temple and things like that. So it has... It, it, it um, has a lot of scripture words uh, that line up with the Book of Mormon, but then it diverges in these kinds of areas. Okay. Now, in looking at it, the reasons I don't think it are it's authentic are uh, first that um, it just doesn't read as authentic to me. Like I said, it reads like uh, a modern attempt to uh, make a. Um, make some Book of Mormon scripture to say what you what you want it to say. This, this, that's how it reads to me, at least. Uh, there is, when I read it, um, what I think is a factual inconsistent with, inconsistency with the Book of Mormon that I think is a mistake that kind of shows uh, that it's not authentic. And this occurs uh, related to the son, Corey Anton. So in the Nemanha records, Another thing it does, this is kind of, again fits with sort of the critical theory type uh, way of thinking that, uh, you know, prophets are bad, the, good, the people that were good were actually bad, the people that were bad were actually good. And it does that with uh, Corey Anton and Isabel. Now, you're probably familiar in the Book of Mormon with the story of Alma's son, Corey Anton, um, in Alma uh, chapter 31. Alma and, and, and a group, which includes his son, uh, Corey Anton and other sons, they go to try to reclaim the Zoramites so that they don't join the Lamanites. And uh, in Alma chapter 39 to 42, after the mission, Alma talks to Corey Anton and he, you know, gives a lot of scripture and explanation about resurrection and this life and so forth. But he also uh, rebukes... Um, he rebukes uh, Corey Anton about having abandoned the ministry. And this is uh, uh, 74 BC. So this is, here is Alma chapter 39, again, like it says here about 74 BC. And then in verse three, uh, Alma tells him, you did that which was grievous unto me. You did forsake the ministry and you went over into the land of Siren among the borders of the Lamanites after the harlot Isabel. So he, he criticizes Corianton for abandoning the ministry and going after uh, a harlot. And then and he talks about how that caused um, trouble in teaching and trying to convert the Zoramites because uh, the wickedness of his son was very well known and, and, um, understood there. Okay, so that was in 74 BC. Now, uh, the year after this, in Alma 45, this is 73 BC, in verse 18, this is when after Alma had talked with his sons, he then departs out of the land, and it came to pass he was never heard of more. And as to his death or burial, we know not up. So this is what that's what happened. So they had that mission. He rebukes Corey Anton, and then the next year Alma departs out of the land. Now in the Nemenha records, what it does is it gives an alternative account, and it says that uh, it tells uh, says that Corey Anton went to the land northward, and is there with Isabel, and that they're married and you know righteous. And uh, that they get the story from Corey Anton. And what Corey Anton says is that 
Isabel um, was righteous, that she had repented, that Corianton found her on the mission, that they fell in love. They never did anything wrong, but these bad rumors were uh, spread about them and that Isabel had gone over to live with the Nephites. Corianton thought that she would be protected and taken care of until after his mission and that when he got back from his mission, uh, she had been uh, neglected and mistreated uh, by the Nephites and Corianton is mad and he takes uh, Isabel and they go to the land northward. He, he's he, And it says they did this immediately, essentially, that he comes back, she finds her situation, they leave uh, to the land northward. And then it says that Alma uh, ends up being really distraught about this. And then he kind of realizes that what he had done was wrong, that he had misjudged. Uh, he misjudged them, and that when he wanders off here in Alma 45, it's because he's uh, basically depressed and with a broken heart. And uh, so that's the story. And then the Menha records uh, that were uh, Corey Anton and Isabel kind of become the hero, and Alma was sort of the um, too judgy uh, person that that was actually the that made a mistake there. Okay, now the problem is though, is that the Nemenha record says that Corianton left at the end of his mission before Alma departs out of the land. So in the Book of Mormon, Alma departs out of the land in 73 BC, which means that Cor Corianton would have had to have gone to that land northward uh, before that, before Alma wanders off and is never seen again. But in the Book of Mormon, that's not what happens, because actually in Alma chapter 49, a few chapters later, and this is in 72 BC, so just the year after that, if you go to verses 29 and 30, it talks about how the people of Nephi at that time were in peace and uh, prospered because they of the word of God, which was declared unto them by Helaman, Shiblon, and Corianton. So it shows that um, Corianton was and unlike what the Nemenaha record which indicates that which said that he went to you know was upset and went to the land northward and never came back for for many years in the Book of Mormon it says that he was still here in uh, Zarahemla teaching so to me that's a factual conflict that if you look at the Nemenaha records and judge them against the Book of Mormon assuming the Book of Mormon to be correct which I do then it, it doesn't look like they're they're um, correct scriptures. So I, I don't accept the Nemenha records as correct scriptures. All right, let me go ahead and stop share for a second there. There are two last ones, which I'll just mention briefly. This one, should we worship Heavenly Mother? That seems to be getting some popularity. And the, um, the theory related to Hezekiah and Josiah and this, that emphasizing and putting more front and center uh, Heavenly Mother is, um, I think, kind of feeding this. And uh, this is contrary to what we've been taught. We've been taught very clearly that while there is a Heavenly Mother, that um, they don't want us to put her front and center, that are instead we're supposed to worship God the Father only. We do that through uh, Jesus Christ, and that's that's who they want us to focus on, and that's who we're supposed to, and we only pray to to the Father through that. Okay, and then finally, this one: Should women have been given the priesthood? And this is something that comes up in that in the Manha record as well. Is that it? Kind of uh, like I said, it, it takes these people that says that they're Nephites in the land northward and. It has uh, the women there um, healing and giving blessings and breaking the sacrament. And when it has a Jesus Christ visit them, it has a woman, you know, who's doing the sacrament there. And it has Jesus kind of, you know, basically approve that and say that that's what the way it's supposed to be. And um, I would say about that, that I stick to what we have been taught and I think it's uh, we should be careful about letting go of the iron rod for these things that you might have a, a social or 
desire to to be more accepted or 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 you think hey in my mind that makes more sense or it should be that way but i would encourage us to stick with the iron rod stay in the ship's line as it says and at the very least i want it clear that that i don't accept those things um i do present new ideas i i new DNA evidence, geography theories, things like that. Uh, I think all of those are helpful, but they're all consistent with the uh, gospel as we have been taught by the collective witness of the prophets and in the scriptures. And I don't uh, agree with, and I just want to make it clear, I do not uh, advocate any of these new theories that I think are contrary to the traditional understanding of the church. All right, just wanted to leave that with you. Feel free to to make comments or or um, suggestions below. I encourage you to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks.